UMC, has anyone seen Luis Perez? <laughs> oh, there he is. Welcome to worship this morning. We have a great morning of music and song and spoken word, and I'll let Luis take it from here. He could have finished it. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pacific Beach United Methodist Church. There we are, nice and center. I'm Luis Perez, a song leader for the morning, and again, you've met Ron Jesse, our organist and pianist here at PBMC. Today's pianist is Judy Beaver. Judy has been playing our pre-service music. Thank you, Judy. And members of Voices of Praise, and we're going to get things started with Break Forth into Song. If we haven't met already, my name is Bob Rhodes. I'm the lead pastor here at Pacific Beach United Methodist Church. Thank you for choosing to be in worship today. Um, it's my hope that you experience the movement of God's Holy Spirit as we worship together this day, um, but also in the hopes of that experience that you might share that experience, whether that's in a face-to-face -face conversation with someone who's here or someone who's not here. Uh, but if you're a digital person, a, a social media person, you might uh, share whatever that experience might be through any of your uh, preferred social media channels. I invite you to do that. Um, a special greeting to those who are joining us online. Thank you for joining our live stream today. Um, live stream is a great way to sort of understand what happens in this faith community, but we'd also love to welcome you uh, in person in this place, and I want you to know that you're invited to participate. Um, we're continuing our sermon series called Somos del Señor, which uh, is a, a Spanish phrase that means we, we belong to God. Um, and, and today uh, we address uh, the, the next sort of section of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth where he really directly addresses division in the church, and particularly as United Methodist churches, we might, uh, we might be cognizant of the idea of division in church. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, and we're going to talk about that through a, a Wesleyan context. Uh, Wesley wrote a sermon called The Catholic Spirit. Now, for our Catholic friends, he's not talking about the Roman Catholic Church, but he's talking about the word Catholic meaning universal. Um, and, and I'll even confess to you that most of our sermon today comes directly from John Wesley with a little bit of rephrasing for today's language because if I just read it as Wesley wrote it, we may not understand what he's saying. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, an idea that I think is worth sharing. And so I invite you to be open to the possibilities of transcending division as we worship today. Sing the one. See and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Judy is going to play a song this morning uh, for our music meditation called When We All Get to Heaven. And we're dedicating this song to our beloved brother, Al Herman, who we will celebrate today at noon in a memorial service when we all get to heaven.
Thank you, Judy. What a great way to celebrate Al's life. My name is Tim Adams. I'm your worship leader this morning. And if you'll join me now in the responsive reading, which is found on the screen or in your bulletin. To those who sit in darkness, light has dawned. To those who dwell in gloom and despair, God's glorious presence has appeared. God is indeed our light and our salvation. Let us worship God of light and promise. Let us celebrate the hope and joy of our salvation. Now please rise as you're able and let us sing together hymn number 98, To God Be the Glory. Please hold these words in your heart as I pray them aloud. God of light and love, we come this morning with eyes stinging from the brightness of your glory. We have become accustomed to the darkness, that your radiant light sometimes overwhelms us. Open our eyes that the light of your dawn, that our souls may be flooded with your love and mercy and joy. Break through the clouds that separate us one from another, that we may worship you as one body. Guide our steps that we may walk in your light and live as your people of love. We pray in union with the love of Christ. Amen. Now please turn to one another and share the peace of Christ. And as you return to your seats, please feel free to join in the chorus of soon and very soon.
be seated. Unless you just feel like standing, that's fine. Um, uh, just as I ask that you might share with others uh, uh, your experience in worship today, I hope you'll share with us that you're in worship today. Our ushers will distribute our friendship pads, which uh, on a practical uh, level is a way for us to know who's joining us in worship today. But on a spiritual and connectional level, uh, it's a way for us to connect with one another uh, in a deeper way. And so uh, you'll find that there are opportunities to, uh, 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 to sign up for our, some of our communications, particularly our digital communications, which includes a, a weekly email, a monthly newsletter, and there are some other options as well. Um, if you wish to update us on any physical or digital address information, there's a place to do that so that we might remain in connection with one another. Uh, also, in that spiritual sense, I want you to know that as these come into the office, I take time to pray for you, and I thought that you ought to know that somebody's going to be praying for you in the coming days. If you have specific prayer requests, I'd invite you to use the blue prayer cards that are in the pockets in front of you. With the friendship pads and the prayer cards, you can pass those along your pew and leave those on the outer aisle so that the ushers can collect those. Please leave the prayer cards on top because the ushers will bring those up to me so that I can include your prayer later in our worship service. If your prayer is something that's confidential, there's a place to mark that so we can lift up your prayer without uh, sh sharing any of those specifics. I do have uh, one bit of sad news to share with you, and we'll be lifting this up uh, during our prayer time, but sometimes it can be abrupt to only hear it during the prayer time. I got a call this morning from Linda Altus, who's a longtime member of this congregation. She's our financial secretary for the church. Uh, her husband died quite suddenly in the night. Um, so uh, it, it will come to a time where we lift up Linda uh, in prayer, but I, I wanted you to have that news. Um, uh, we have a number of announcements uh, uh, in addition to this difficult news. We have a number of announcements in your order of worship. I do want to make sure that I highlight that we are celebrating the life of Al Herman this afternoon at noon right here in the sanctuary. Um, and so I hope that you'll come uh, and celebrate Al's life. Please be prepared to, uh, to bring your stories about Al. I'm sure that there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of stories about Al. Um, and so I hope that you'll come and participate and share those stories. Um, so as I said, there are some uh, announcements in your order of worship. We'll highlight some by video, and so we'll move to our video announcements. Good morning and welcome to Pacific Beach United Methodist Church. I'm Joe Peterson. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. We've got a lot happening with the church, so let's take a few minutes to find out what's going on. Do you have one of these? or maybe even one of these? These are the older church directories for PBUMC. We're working on getting an updated directory for the current members. If you're interested in participating in the planning committee for this new directory, please contact the church office. Thanks again for spending part of your weekend with us. Whether you're here in person or worshiping with us online, we're glad you're here. We believe that God has something to say specifically to you. If you need anything while you're here with us today, please don't hesitate to let an usher or one of the church leaders know. And as always, be sure to connect with us online at pbumc.org or on social media, Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, and Instagram to keep up with everything happening here at Pacific Beach United Methodist Church. Thanks, and have a great week. And one more thing that did not make it to the... Um announcements because it just finally got finalized that on February 29th, but first of all, how many of you guys made resolutions this year? <laughs> Only a few of you? Okay, well, we're going to try and see if we can gather people together. We're going to have a health and wellness seminar on February 29th um, here in the church at the, um, in our Social Hall, thank you. <laughs> and um, it's going to be at 10 in the morning on Saturday, and it's for everyone. If Circle, Circle Health will come in and give us notations, things we could do. It's great for young people. It's great for the elderly. It's something that covers all of us. So I want to put the word out now, and then we will get it um, in the newsletter and into the um, rotation. But I want to let you know, February 29th, mark your calendars. We, we, one of our um, members who are in the second service brought this to my attention, so that's why we're doing the seminar here. So, seminar for health and wellness, February 29th. February 29th is leap day, so if you come, you have to leap to get here. I'm just kidding. Uh, now comes a time where we welcome our youngest worshipers, so if you're a child in worship or feeling particularly childlike, you're welcome to come up for our children's time. Wow, hi everybody. 
You don't. If you want to come up, you don't have to sprint. Hi. I said you don't have to sprint. Some. It seems like most of you did. You've had something to say the whole. I saw you raising your hand in the back. I'm sorry. I just wanted to be able to to be closer and give you more of my attention. So that's why I waited. What What did you want to say? Um. Oh, if you don't listen, you might get a timeout. Yep. Sometimes that happens for me. Sometimes that happens for me. Hi there. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this church. You know, I was having a conversation with somebody today. Hi. Oh, look. who. You, oh, you have Mickey. Oh, thank you for showing me. Wow, isn't Mickey cool? Oh, I, well, all right. I won't keep it. All right. <laughs> um, I, I was having a conversation with someone today about what makes this church different? What makes it different from other churches? That seems like a good thing for us to talk about, doesn't it? What do you think makes this church different from other churches? What do you think? Um, so, um, and some, chur- some churches are big, and some churches are way small, and some churches are small. Yeah, some churches are really big, and some churches are really small. Some churches are sort of medium. The very first church where I was a pastor, the very first one, you know how many people we had on Sunday morning? Four. It was four, and then my family and I showed up, and so then there were seven. It was before Zach was born. Yep. That's right. Um, So some churches are very small. Some churches are very big. There's a United Methodist Church uh, outside of Kansas City that the way their pastor talks about it, he says 18 or 20,000 members. I'd like to have the 2,000 he's not sure about. Um, so, yeah, some churches are really big. Some churches are really small. What else makes this church different? Yeah, you have another answer. Well, um, so sometimes there's some flags in here. Sometimes there's some flags. Sure, we have lots of decorations. Yeah. yeah, we do. Well, we have an American flag. It's right back there. Okay. Yep. All right. What else? What other kinds of things make this church different? Yeah. So I want to talk about, you know, You know, one of the things we talk about is we talk about this church, Pacific Beach United Methodist Church, and we talk about how our church welcomes everybody, and that's an important part uh, of this church. Um, The person I was talking to today was asking, just a minute, you have lots of things to say, I know, but just a minute. Um, The person I was talking to was asking about, uh, like, what makes the United Methodist Church different? And there's one thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit um, that makes, you know, Methodists a little bit different from from some of our other uh, uh, other uh, denominations, at least the way we talk about it. Um, we feel like, and we've talked about this before, by coming to church, by participating in church, maybe by praying and reading our Bibles, that we feel like by doing those things that God changes us on the inside in important ways. Have we, have we talked about that before? We've talked about that a little bit. But then... Not only do we feel that change inside of us, but we feel like after we've become changed that maybe we should do good work to help the world be a better place. And the way we talk about that um, in sort of big grown-up words is personal holiness and social holiness. But it's that idea that God changes us on the inside, helps us to be better people, and then when we are changed, when we are better people, then maybe God uses us to help the world be a better place. Does that seem like a good thing to do? I think it's a good thing to do. So for for the adults in the room, we talk about that in terms of personal holiness and social holiness. If it's helpful to know that on a different level, the idea that we are changed and then that we're called to make the world a better place. That's a good thing. Yes, one more thing to say and then we'll pray. He's, he's reminding us that snakes can be dangerous, especially if they're poisonous snakes, that they might bite us. You know, there's a scripture about snakes in the Bible. There's a whole story about some people who are really afraid of poisonous snakes, and I'd like to share that sometime. That's right. The rattlesnakes, they, 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 they rattle their tails to help us know that they're feeling afraid and that we should keep our distance. That's a good thing for us to know. One more thing, and then we're praying, I promise. Right. 
you remember a verse about a, a box and snakes in it? Well, I don't, I'm not thinking about that verse. The, the verse that I'm thinking about is a, 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 a time with Moses, and they're in the wilderness with the Israelites, and uh, there's lots of snakes about, and, and people are really worried. And so what they do is they make this bronze staff, uh, and they put a, a bronze, so a fake, a, a mold of a snake on the staff, uh, and they say, if you get bit, look at this, and you'll be healed. Now, that sounds sort of supernatural and sort of hard to get my head around, but there are ways that we can think about that that I think might be helpful. But we'll talk about that another time. I said that we were going to pray after that, so we're going to do that now. And so uh, if you remember, I like to pray uh, and for you to repeat after me, and you all can join in too. Dear God, thanks for what makes us different. Not because it makes us better. It just makes us different. Like the colors of a rainbow. Help us to be glad about those differences. Help us to see beauty in everything. Amen. All right, thank you for coming up to chat with me. If you're heading off to Sunday school, you're already sprinting down the center aisle <laughs> or uh, stretching your hamstrings. Either way is fine. <laughs>
Last week, as we began this sermon series, Somos del Señor, the idea that we belong to Christ, we belong to God, um, we read just the first few verses from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, and in doing so, we sort of just saw the beginning of, of a hint that in the letter that he's writing to this church that, uh, uh, that has sort of grown in this, uh, this Greek city of Corinth, um, he's beginning to see some hints of division, and he, he alludes to that, and we address that, that perhaps even we who may experience division, if we, can, if we can center ourselves in the idea that before anything else, we belong to God, that before anything else, we belong to Christ, then maybe we might have this sense that this might unite us in a way that transcends division. I, I like that idea. You know, in a world that seems increasingly divisive, the idea that we can transcend that division I find helpful. But at the same time, I find it incredibly challenging because sometimes some of the ways that I observe division I feel angry about. I'm not one, certainly from the pulpit, who takes sides in terms of a political arena, and I'm not going to do that in this case. And there's no doubt that there is political division, that what is happening in the Senate, they're taking a day off. You may be on one side of that or the other, but there's not a whole lot of folks who are in between. And it's hard on us. As a culture, it's hard on us to experience a sense of division in this way. To be divided left and right, uh, Republican and Democrat, not everybody's in those two groups, but those are the two major groups, it's hard. But where I feel angry about it is in our ongoing cultural conversation about inclusion and particularly our denominational conversation about inclusion. Because I observe when I have the opportunity and have had the opportunity to be in ministry with our LGBTQIA siblings, I see God's spirit moving among all people regardless of the ways persons are divided. And when I hear someone say, well, I'm not going to do that couple's wedding. I'm not going to baptize their children. I'm not going to see God's gifts in those people and lift them up for ordained ministry or even leadership in my local congregation. I feel angry. I feel angry even knowing that I'm not one who's personally affected by those things. I feel angry on behalf of my friends. Knowing, knowing that for some of my friends and colleagues, I simply cannot know that ache and that pain of being told that you are not enough. So in this time when the United Methodist Church is, is facing potential schism, potential divorce, I wrestle between this idea of is it possible to transcend and be united in Christ? Now, I'll tell you, I do find a little bit of hope, some glimmers from time to time. You may remember a couple of weeks ago that there was an article in the Union Tribune, and then it was uh, quoted later on, or it was reprinted later on in the L.A. Times. And you may remember the closing quotes. I'm not going to quote myself. I'm not ready to do that. But quoting my friend Jonathan, Jonathan and I disagree on matters of inclusion and yet Jonathan says this. He identifies who he is. He says, this is who we are. He said, but if this is not who you are, I have this great friend Bob. And if that's where you are, I could heartily recommend him. I find glimmers of hope from time to time that maybe it might be possible to see that, that transcendence. But let's hear first briefly how Paul describes this division in the church in Corinth, because I think we might find some parallels. And I'll talk briefly about that text, and then I'll close with a sermon that's been in my mind, written by John Wesley a few hundred years ago. It's just, it's been on my mind enough that I feel like it's not me that's thinking about it, it's God placing it there. 
and so I feel compelled to share it. Um, first, Tim, do you mind if I read the scripture today? It's, you know, I just, I, when I read, when I read it, I've been reading it all week, and when I read the text, it's so conversational. It's honestly, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different than I often experience Paul's, um, uh, Paul's reading, but it just, hear how, hear how this comes across. You know, you know how when you read something to yourself, you just sort of hear it in your own voice in your head? And so I've been reading it this way. Uh, just, just hear how, how we're able to engage this text. Uh, so this is uh, the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 10. Now, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you, that, that you're fighting with each other. See, what I mean is that, that each of you says, oh, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or, or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you. Except Crispus and Gaius. So that, so that nobody can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, otherwise, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach good news. And Christ didn't teach me to preach good news with clever words so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed. But it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. I love how Paul has a bit of a senior moment. I don't think I baptized any of you. Oh, wait, no, I did baptize some of you. But the core of what he's talking about, the core of his critique of what they're doing he highlights the ways people are, are sort of building coalitions as we're wont to do. I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos. I belong to Cephas. I belong to Christ. I had to really think about, well, why is it bad if somebody says, I belong to Christ? Maybe it's the pronoun. Maybe it's not I belong to Christ. Maybe the critique is we belong to Christ. You know, I've been reading through this text over and over again and trying to find out what it is that I would say. And as I said, the words that kept showing up for me were not mine. And I think it's important, especially as a person of privilege, to step back so that other words might be lifted up. Now, it turns out I'm lifting up the words of another straight white guy, but that's okay because I think they're profound words. And I want to share these with you. John Wesley, uh, if, if you remember John Wesley, uh, uh, founded the Methodist tradition, uh, the Methodist movement back in the 18th century. Wesley wrote a sermon called The Catholic Spirit. And, and I'd like to share the ideas of this sermon with you. As I said earlier this morning, I'm not going to read it the way Wesley wrote it because we would have trouble getting through the these and the thous and the King James language. So I've rewritten it in contemporary language, and I think I've remained faithful to John's ideas, and I think they're beautiful, and I think, I think it helps us maybe to have that sense of, well, maybe, maybe as people of God, maybe as people of Christ, maybe as people empowered by the Spirit, we can see the possibility of transcending those things that divide us. And so here now, John Wesley's sermon, A Catholic Spirit, reframed with this question, do you believe? You'll hear a couple of names in this text. Uh, Wesley references a very brief sermon in second, or a very brief scripture in Second Kings um, where there's uh, uh, two people. There's Yehu, who is the tenth king of, uh, of Judah, and then Yehonadab, uh, I'm mispronouncing that name, um, uh, who is sort of a, a secondary character, but with whom they partner um, in, in battle but they come from different places and they decide to work together. 
Here's how it goes. We as persons of faith, even as Christians, are familiar with the idea of loving one another. We have heard the instruction to to love our neighbor even as we love ourselves. We have even read that we must love our enemies, blessing those who curse us, doing good to those who hate us, praying for all persons even if they take advantage of, of us or if they abuse us. We remember the New Testament scripture from the 13th chapter of John where Jesus gives his disciples a new commandment. He tells them to love each other just as they have been loved. And it is in this way that they will be known to the world. We read in 1 John that love is of God and that one who does not love cannot possibly know God. We understand this. We know this. The question is, do we do it? I'm afraid the answer may be no. So what gets in our way? The reality is that no two people see the world in the same way. We don't think exactly the same way. We don't reason exactly the same way. And so we don't act exactly the same way. So does this mean we can't share some common ideas? So Yehu asked Yehonadab if they could share some ideas. And the answer was yes. It went like this. First, Yehu asked if Yehonadab's heart was true to his own as his was to Jehonadab's. And then he offered his hand. Now what does this question mean? What does it mean to ask, is your heart as true to mine as mine is to yours? Note that there's nothing here as to someone's opinion. Everybody has an opinion, everybody. If it's about politics politics or, or taxes or religion or food or the right way to tie a shoe, everyone has an opinion. It's natural. It's the order of the world. And mostly, everyone is sure that their opinion is right. And for the most part, everybody knows that somewhere, maybe in the deep, dark recesses of the unknown, that they're wrong about something, even if what they could possibly be wrong about is a mystery. And for the most part, we understand why we all perceive and think differently. But even in faith, isn't there supposed to be one unalterable truth with a capital T? Is there one correct way to be a person of faith, to worship? In the scripture passage, there was no explicit mention of faith. I mean, he didn't ask, where do you go to church? He didn't ask, do you have a choir or a praise band? He didn't ask, do you sit quietly in church or do you shout out? Because we know there are different kinds of, there are different ways to worship. We all think differently. We see the world differently. We see the divine differently. And we practice our faith differently. It makes sense. We understand this. So how do we know what's right? The answer is we must choose for ourselves. And more than that, we cannot choose for someone else. Now, some would say that we're born into our faith. If I was born into a Methodist family, that I'll be a Methodist. And while that's true for me, it's certainly not true for my sisters, both of whom were born into the same Methodist family I was. If this were, well, frankly, if this idea were true, we'd all be Catholic. So I suggest that it's not appropriate to impose our, our worship or our faith on someone else. When we meet someone, even in a faith environment, we let the little things go. True, we can talk about things, but maybe out of interest rather than out of judgment. We can simply ask, is your heart as true to mine as mine is to yours? Do you believe? Are you a person of faith? But what do those questions mean? I mean, we're asking if they believe that there's something more out there, if there's some kind of higher meaning, some kind of higher power in and and perhaps even beyond the world. We're asking if they find comfort in what they believe, if they get their faith in what, if they get from their faith what they need. We're asking if they're motivated beyond or outside themselves. We're asking if they treat the world and humanity with the love and respect they wish to be shown, and do they do those things outwardly and visibly? Do they do them tangibly? If so, give me your hand. See, it doesn't, it doesn't mean to think what I think. It doesn't mean to do what I do. It doesn't mean to believe what I believe. Keep your ideas and your opinions and your beliefs, and I'll keep mine. Let's not argue. 
Let's just talk. Let's get to know each other. Let's be in community. Community. Uh, am I trying to convert subversively into my form of worship or, or faith? No. I don't mean that. I don't mean worship the way I do, I do or, or I'll worship the way you do. Let's just talk. Let's not argue. Let's be in relationship. And let us relate beyond the trappings of, acquaint, of acquaintance or distant relative. With those people, we often agree in voice just to be polite. Let us be in relationship, to dialogue, to share, and even to celebrate our differences. Let us be so close that we can be honest with one another. And let's do so in a way that is patient and kind, that is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Let us not insist on our own way or be irritable or resentful. Let us be in relationship. Pray for me, if that's your tradition, and let me do the same for you in my tradition. Ask that I be influenced by the divine, and I'll ask the same for you. And call me out as nicely as you can if you see that I'm doing something for myself rather than for my fellow humanity or for the ultimate. And join me. Join me. Together we can do great things. And so from this, we may find more clarity. What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to be a person of faith? It is not indifference. It is a celebration, a dialogue, and it is a joining together in relationship. It's not vague understanding. Indeed, it is deep conviction with deep openness. It is not either or. It is both and. And the one who believes, the one who is of faith, recognizes those who were of faith, perhaps even asking the question, is your heart true to mine as mine is to yours? And reaches out in dialogue and in relationship. Think about these things. Ruminate in them. Run the race that is set before you, solid in your faith, open-minded to the world and to divine things, grounded in love, so that you might be swallowed up in love forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you into a prayerful time. We will sing together, and it is my hope that we will experience the Spirit together.
Friends, let us continue in this spirit of prayerfulness. Holy God, as we are gathered together in an experience of community, help us to connect with one another. And in doing so, help us to connect with you. Help us to know that whether we call you God or by some other name or simply know a higher power in the universe, that we're not alone that we might experience strength that comes from beyond us, that we might experience comfort that comes from outside of us, that we might know some different presence than our own that calls us, that guides us, that strengthens us, that celebrates with us, and that knows our innermost thoughts. Let's find comfort and peace in this time. God, as we connect with one another, as we lean on one another, we lift up the prayers of this community. A prayer for our friend. During this time of prayer, as we pray here in the sanctuary at PBUMC, I invite you to be in prayer. Pray for your community, the ways you're connected with this faith community, but also your personal community to see God's light and hope and love. Australia, the people in Puerto Rico. God, we live in places where there is violence, whether that is city on city, country on country, or domestic violence. That your peace might be known. God, we lift up all these things and all that are left unsaid as we join together in the prayer taught to us by your Son, our Christ, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we continue in this prayerful time as the ushers wait upon us, and we give of our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Stand as we sing our doxology.
please join me in the prayer of dedication found on the screen or in your bulletin. God of light and love, we have in recent weeks sung songs announcing the birth of our Savior. We have embraced Christ's baptism and our own. We have acknowledged the light that came into the world through Christ. And now it is time to hear Jesus' call to follow. We offer these gifts of you as token, knowing that truly all we need to let go of all those who us in a different, different direction. Help us to find faithful in following. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us sing our final hymn, 557, Blessed Be the Tide that Binds, verses 1, 3, and 4. Friends, I hope that you'll continue to connect with one another. We'll have some uh, refreshments out uh, either in our courtyard or in the social hall, depending on how cold it is out there. Um, but I hope that you'll connect with one another. Um, please don't forget to come back for today's memorial service for Al Herman. When you go to your homes, when you go to your communities, go seeking to express yourselves as that profound and transcendent love that breaks boundaries, that breaks division, and that builds relationship. Amen. Amen.